I realize I don't have a bullet gun. <laughs> Good morning. good morning it's good to see you all here this morning and welcome to first church in Wenham. we are so happy that you've joined us online and here in person these are, these are the people that like to get up in the morning you're not laughing maybe they're still sleepy i think there are half the congregation is at home in bed which is where well, i feel like i am so I oh know. well let me, let me do my part here Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times. Come yet again. Come. Join us in the seeking, the parade of hope and light. To the queer and to the straight, to the cis and the transgender. To the proud Christian to the barely Christian or never Christian, to the spiritual, not religious, and the not religious, but spiritual. To those deconstructing everything, to those reconstructing something, to those sure about everything, to those not sure about anything. To those who love God but aren't sure about Christ, to those who love Christ but aren't sure about God. To those lamenting and mourning and crying. To those celebrating, resting, and healing. To those who desire to flourish. To everyone in between all of this. You are not alone and are surrounded by fellow travelers and wayfarers, searchers and seekers and lovers of God. We pray that you find a blessing today and a sense of belonging in this community of love, light, and enduring hope. Yay. Yeah. I'm glad I'm here. Aren't you glad you're here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so are you looking to me to make an announcement? Well, uh, do you have some, I believe you have some announcements. I have I a lot. Look, I have a lot. All right. Okay. Let's go to it. So today is muffin, mission muffin morning. Yay, Yay muffins. And who knows what muffin morning is? Lillian, you know what it is? What do we do on muffin morning? Yeah. Never. That's right. It's where the kids go into the kitchen and make muffins to sell during coffee hour at $2 a muffin to benefit Heifer. That's exactly right. And um, today it's the first to the fifth graders 
that it, after the children's message, we're going to go to, the, to Holland Hall to make muffins. And the pre-K to kindergarten goes downstairs, but next week they get to go and make muffins. And the middle schoolers, six to eight, go downstairs to the teen lounge. And everyone comes up afterwards and has muffins. So I think that's, oh, and then I have this thing. I have too many papers. This is called a family fun pack from Heifer. So this is gonna be available in Holland Hall for the elementary school kids to take home. And it's a fun little thing and you learn a little bit more about Heifer. And the, the pre-Ks downstairs will get a family pack. I don't know, I thought the middle school was a little old for this, but you never know, you know, mazes are always fun. So you can decide. Mary can just sneak one and not tell her she's taking it home for her brother. But that's all I have. The Heifer Project I absolutely love. It's such a great organization, yeah. And uh, so we're selling the muffins today. That'll be good. We're going to have... Next week, too. And next week, too. So yeah. we're going to have full muffin bellies. And there's a gluten-free option, so get in there early to get the gluten-free. <laughs> there's only two dozen of those. We have uh, some other things going on today. What else? Well, we also have... Um, the uh, Cayenta fundraiser, we are, for our Cayenta auction, we're going to be uh, selling tickets to the auction. You oh. can get your tickets today. Do you remember that promise You have I to made? see the lovely Dorothy, and she will be able to input your name, and uh, we'll, you can buy a ticket for, for her, you from need her. To, you need to ask me the question. What's the remember question? Remember the promise I made a few weeks ago? Yeah, with your scratch ticket? No, I get scratch tickets at Christmas. I just want to say that. I don't go buying them all the time. I'm not like a gambling addict. I don't buy them because I don't want to become a gambling addict. But I got a bunch at Christmas and forgot about them. And so a few weeks ago, I scratched a few tickets, and I got a $100 ticket. I never got a $100 ticket before. And I don't know, the spirit got a hold of me one, one day, one time I was standing here with Sean, and I said, I'm going to buy $100 worth of tickets, and I've only bought $20 worth of tickets. Oh. I owe you $80, so find me. <laughs> so uh, you can buy the Cayenta uh, auction tickets today, and just uh, see Dorothy and Don. Don will be Oh, you're talking about there. auction. I'm talking about the 50-50 raffle. Oh, the 50-50 raffle. Yeah. That's also happening today. We, I could do both. Yes. Okay. Do it. All right. Okay. We'll ask it later. <laughs> um, also going on today is um, following uh, the service around 11.45 or so, uh, Rick Jones. Raise your hand, Rick. Rick and I are going to be doing a discussion on our vision statement. So if you'd like to be a part of that, please join us in the, uh, the meeting area um, beside, uh, between our two offices. And uh, we will be looking at our vision statement and having conversations around that. That's one of many meetings that are going on. And if you take a look at your email, uh, church newsletter, then there are various <clears throat> places that you can sign up to go to for these discussion groups. This being one of them, we had our very first one at Brooksby Village on Friday. That was really exciting, and we had a really good discussion. So we're, we're looking at our vision statement and having conversations around that, and we're hoping that as many of you could sign up for these groups as possible. Can I add one thing? If you're like me and things get lost in your email inbox and you can't find the newsletter or the email that has a link in it, Christine said give her a call in the office and she'll send it to you directly. So don't be embarrassed because I do it. I lose, lose track of things. Yeah. A lot of things come through it. So over the next few weeks, we will be doing those meetings, various places in Wenham and in, up in uh, Rockland, Rockport, and uh, Rockland would be a long ways away, <laughs> Rockport and other places, Salem. So uh, please make a point, sign up, come to, uh, to these discussions. And, uh, and so, and Christine will happily sign you up if you need to. Do you have any other announcements? I've got a very special one coming up. I would love, we're going to celebrate somebody today. Somebody has put in 20. Me? Yeah, we, we are, yes, we celebrate you and I your scratch ticket. I love getting celebrated. <laughs> and no, it's, it's not me. It's not for me. the past 20 years, somebody has done an amazing job in this church. And, and she has devoted her time to helping people out in our community. Oh, I think I know. This, who, who, go ahead, no, guess. No, 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 you keep going. Sue, we're, we're celebrating Sue Ackerman today. 
in her 20 years of work. And she's completely... Let's stand up. <laughs> so, Sue, if you would come forward, please. And Sue, being not only just being an amazing, wonderful person, we are celebrating her 20 years of volunteering on parish care. And she and her parish care team have done amazing work. And it's all behind the scenes and incredibly meaningful, driving people to, to uh, doctor's appointments and other important appointments and writing cards and remembering people in time of need and, and just providing that, that beautiful service uh, in love and in the name of Christ. And so we are so grateful for all that you have done for our church and, and our wider community. So thank you very much. Thank you. Volunteers. And to all the volunteers, yes. Else to say? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for make, for coordinating everything and for all the volunteers over the years that have helped. It, it is truly a special, special thing that you all do. I and didn't realize it was 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And now, let us all be in this place, be present here and now in this worship time. And may we all take a deep breath and let it out, coming present to ourselves, one more breath in and out, and present to each other and to God. And now let us hear the chapel chimes. John 3.16 is probably one of the most infamous and oft-quoted oft scriptures in the Bible. What follows that verse is important for our Lenten journey. God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to offer its saving light. As followers of that light, we are called to be those who will continue to light up the world through our lives so that the world might see the hope it yearns for. Please join me in the prayer of presence. Infinite love, heart of all life, you love this world into being with such love as to birth us among us. Love begotten as the beloved, opening ourselves to your love, we live beyond our mortal selves and join your eternal oneness. Your presence does not separate, but unites. 
Love does not push away, but embraces. You do not condemn, but save. Trusting this, we know we are loved and never rejected. When our trust fails, we are doomed, withdrawing into ourselves. We aren't open to love, which is the only source of life. Amen. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the dominion, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
Thank you, choir. I, um, I want to invite the children to come forward, the young at heart, the curious. Hi, Jackson. I brought something today. What? You made a happy face? Yeah. That's a good face. So I don't know how my super cape got in here. I didn't mean to take my super cape here. What else do I have? Oh, I have this. What is this? Um, a bead heart. It, it's, it's a heart. What does it remind you of? Love. Love. Peace. Kindness. Brooke, do you want to hold the heart? No? Okay. Who's in front of me? Is that Reese? Yeah. Do you want to hold the heart? So what does it remind you of when you see the heart? Friendship? Friendship? Does it remind anybody of a holiday we had in February? Yeah. What's that called? Christmas. Jesus' birthday. No, that was December. Oh, yeah. Valentine's Day. And we see there are hearts everywhere, right? Well, when I see hearts, um, it makes me think about love. And because we always talk about our heart being the part that loves. And Sean is going to be talking about love when he t does his sermon. And we're going to be doing acts of love in the other, in the other room. Um, and I'll tell you what that's about. But God made us very special. One of my favorite people is Mr. Rogers. And he said that there's nobody in the world quite like you. You're all a little different. We're all a little different. And yet God loves each of us equally, no matter whether we're tall or short or young or old, but God loves us equally. And God wants us to have love-filled lives, wants us to have love in our lives. And that's why Jesus came, because Jesus came to share that love and spread the love around. And Jesus said something special. He, he said, here's, here's a new commandment that is, um, helps you to live the right way. And he said, love God love each other, and love yourself. So I wonder, how do we do that? So let me have another thing in here. Get my super cape out of the way. Here, Abby, you hold my super cape. You can even put it on if you want. So what's, what's this? It's a heifer box. So what do we do with this heifer box? You put money in it, and then where does the money go? To heifer. To heifer. And then what does heifer do with the money? Do you know? Yeah, they give, they, one of the things that we, they do a lot of things with children, with adults, um, but they give, what we do is we, we have them buy animals for families so the animal can be their job, basically. They become farmers and the animals help them produce income so they have enough money for their family to take care of their family. And they don't just give them an animal, they give them animal and training on how to do it and how to run a business. And so they, they help lots and lots of families and they don't, don't just do it here, they do it all over the world. So how is this related to a heart? How does, what does this have to do with hearts? Um, you're helping people, that's right. When you, do, when you do that, when we do things like for heifer or for this food pantry and give people food that are hungry, 
it's to help people because we care about people. And if sometimes people are having a hard time, we help them out. And if we're having a hard time, they help us out. That's, that's how we love. So I have one more thing in here. And Emma, I might need your help. What are these? Heart stickers. I was going to say, if you could start passing them out, take a sticker and put it on your put it on your shirt. And this is going to remind you today when we're making muffins and eating muffins. Or you might even want to put it on your box when you get your box, because there are boxes. There are a lot of boxes. Yeah, we're going to collect a lot of money. So that sticker is going to remind you of what we're doing. Why are we doing this? Why do we do the Heifer Project? Because we care about people, because we're friends. One of the things that um, someone I know said, the way to love God is to do what is right, to be kind to one another, and to be friends with God. And when we help Heifer or we help any other, any people, we're being friends with God. It makes God smile. So let's put our hands together and say a prayer, and you can get up so you can give the, to Brooke and Addie and Emma. Can you give one to Penny? Thank you. So let's put our hands together, and you can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the people in our lives who love us. And help us to love others by doing what is right. Being kind to one another. And being friends with God. Amen. Now I'm going to give you the direction again. If you're in elementary school, first grade to fifth grade, you're going to go directly to Holland Hall where, where the muffin making is going to happen. And if you're in pre-K or kindergarten, you're going to go downstairs where you usually go, and the same with the middle schoolers. Yes, 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 yes. So thank you, and we'll see you later for muffins.
During our prayer time, I invite you to uh, look at the prayer concerns of our church and notice the folks who need our prayer. Let us join together in prayer. Today, O oh God, we reflect on the powerful transformation that occurs when we allow our journeys through this life to be witnessed by others. Rather than hiding our imperfections and denying our fully human selves, we accept your call to offer our light, to show up just as we are in this community of faith. And we pray that we can be up to something good for ourselves and our neighbors and our world. This week, oh God, we start with thanksgiving for those acts of uplifting goodness. We give you thanks, oh God, for those who make phone calls to others just to say, I'm thinking of you. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the card writers in our congregation that send the love and remembrance and hope and light through the mail. We give you thanks, O oh God, for those who bake, who make delicious food, so that we can gather around and find the nourishment of conversation and food. We give you thanks, O oh God, for those who make phone calls to get people to sign up to do amazing things. We give you thanks, O oh God, for those who give rides. For the person that smiled at us. O oh God, we give you thanks for the email inquiring how we're doing. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for the goodness that we see in our world. We call upon you, O oh God, to hear our prayers, to extend the love and healing power to many in our congregation, to those who are in need of health and healing, for those walking through and walking the path of grief. We pray for those, O oh God, who are recovering from surgery for those with ongoing health concerns, for those in our community experiencing depression, for those seeking jobs. We pray for ourselves, O oh God, and lift up the prayers of our heart. God of mercy, hear the prayers of our heart.
We call upon you, O God, to give us the strength and the courage to be up to something good for the sake of the good. In this moment, in our mind's eye, we imagine and offer our commitment to one small thing this week that will lift someone up, elevate and affirm, affirm the good we see, and bring a bit more calm or joy where we are. And if we find we are not up to it, we pray that we can accept the goodness of others and feel your encouraging love. And now let us all sing. Gifts are given and gifts are received. And one of the many gifts that my family has received from First Church is the gift of baptism. Way back in 2000, Ted Pomfret <coughs> baptized my twins. That's the second shout out for Ted in two weeks. He's now our MVP, most valuable pastor. <laughs> Can the deacons come forward? Oh. 
Gracious God, with thanks we offer the gifts of our hands and the fruits of our labours. Accept them as expressions of our response to the life and love you have given us. Amen. Our scripture passage for today is the lectionary gospel reading for the fourth Sunday in Lent. It is a very familiar passage from the third chapter of the Gospel of John. Our reading contains a well-known verse of Christian scripture, John uh, chapter 3, verse 16. This short passage appears on billboards, bumper stickers, and advertisements and has been used to scare entice, cajole, or guilt people into becoming Christ's followers. I invite you to hear beyond the many layers of theology and ideology that have, play, that have been placed on this reading. Open your hearts and ears to hear something new, beyond the noise of perhaps, or perhaps pain it could invoke. I will be reading from a different translation in your pew Bible in an effort for us to experience the spirit breathing life into this passage. The context of our passage is part of a nighttime spiritual conversation Jesus is having with a religious leader named Nicodemus. Here is our reading for today. No one has ever gone up into the presence of God except the one who came down from that presence. The Son of Man. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert, so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his one and only Son, and this is why so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has a has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light, so the work can be seen for the God work it is. Here endeth the reading. But because they had stars, all the star belly sneeches would brag. We're the best kind of sneech on the beach. I think it's always good to start off with Dr. Seuss. 
It always means a good morning. The star belly sneeches. Do you remember that? I remember as a kid watching it on TV. The story goes like this, in case you're not familiar. There is a society of yellow bird-like creatures. They're called sneeches. And the sneeches were divided by whether one had a star on his or her belly or didn't. Those with stars on their bellies saw themselves as superior to those without stars and would have nothing to do with the starless lot going so far as to exclude them from their lives. Ah, but a huckster named Sylvester McMoney, Mc, McMonkey McBean Sylvester McMonkey McBean came to town with a machine that would place a star on your belly for a price, of course. The Sneeches without stars longing to be accepted by those with stars on their bellies went through the machine and they came out with stars on their bellies. But those who had stars to be, they began to now be outraged because they could no longer tell the star-bellied sneeches from those who were not. The industrious Mr. McBean told them that for a price, they could go through his machine and have their stars removed, thus allowing them to feel more superior again. This time, those with stars went through the machine and got their stars removed. And around and around and around it went. Sneeches having stars placed on their bellies and Sneeches, Sneeches having stars removed until no one could tell from whence the other had come. Mr. McBean left town with all of their money, but in the process, the Sneeches learned to live together. Hmm. We could just sit with that for a while, I think. <laughs> Football games, billboards, Tracks, little pamphlets left in the bathroom for men on the urinal so you have a little something to read. <laughs> Please, from your relatives, read John 3.16. That is such a loaded and, uh, and powerful verse, and it has been used in so many different ways. It has been used to divide the saved from the damned. It has been used to divide non-believers and believers. It has been used for the exclusivity of Jesus and Christians. It has been used to justify innumerable actions. It has been used to control people. This little snippet of verse from a story that only appears in the Gospel of John, a story about a Pharisee visiting Jesus at night with spiritual questions and seeking a spiritual awakening. And then a whole theology has been built around this one verse in the last 200 years of 2,000 years. Of history. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus and he does not say he needs. And the interesting thing is, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, but Jesus does not say to Nicodemus, Oh, let me, you, let me pray for your forgiveness of sins, or you need to believe in me as your Lord and Savior. Jesus does not say this. To Nicodemus, Jesus does not give an altar call. Jesus does not insist 
on being called Lord and Savior. And so there's an interesting thing of how we built this whole theology around believing in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior through John 3.16, instead of looking at all of Scripture and all the Gospels. Here's what Jesus does in this passage. Jesus speaks of universal truth and of his universal nature expressed in finite human form. A passage that we have often used to exclude is truly universal. The the whole of God, the Gospel of John, the beginning of Gospel of John does not start with a birth narrative, does not start with, uh, with Jesus' ministry. It starts in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christ was with God in the beginning. Through Christ, all things were made, Without Christ, nothing was that has been made. In Christ was life, and that life was the light of all humankind, the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The beginning of the Gospel of John starts at the beginning, the very beginning before creation, that Christ existed. In Genesis, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And so when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, a spiritual teacher himself, the context is from the eternal nature of Christ of God's Son, of God's self. And this is really important, this is an important foundation, and it arises from this eternal and universal place. So when we say, for God so loved the world that God gave his only Son, the only Son, and that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, We begin with, for God so loved the world. And if we look at Genesis and the beginning of John, God loved before creation. Christ loved before there anything was. Christ's love is eternal. That love precedes creation itself and was unconditional. The Greek word for world in this passage is cosmos. Not earth, but the cosmos. For God so loved the cosmos, all there is. Through Christ, all things were made. The cosmos was created through Christ. All inhabitants were created through Christ. God loved the creation including human beings. And so often we see this as human-centric, but God loved into being. And God loved all human beings, not some. Not those who prayed the sinner's prayer. But God's love pre was before of all creation. And love is the basis of creation. The begottenness of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, is from the universal Christ, the Messiah, and comes from eternity. In the passage that we heard that from the message, it talked about, uh, the, the, and this is a part of the lectionary text for today as well, about, of Moses lifting up the serpent so that all that looked up could be saved in the story in the Old Testament so that they could be seen, so they could see faith, is what we read. And so Christ became among us and born of us so that we could see that faith. 
The word belief in this passage is not a one-time thing. It is for us to believe in the love that, that we have eternal life. And it's not believing in things about Jesus. So I think a lot of times when we hear that word, believing, we think, oh, I believe, you know, that tires should be round, or, you know, I believe these certain things, I ascend to the, these thoughts. But the Greek word pistuo means to trust in, to put your life in. And so do we entrust ourselves and others into this eternal love that has always been? And the thing here is, in this passage, this is not a one-time event. The grammar of the Greek suggests it is an ongoing process of trusting in God, placing our life into God's hand, placing our life into this eternal love. And it's happening now and now and now. We can relax in and trust in. We can bet the farm on the eternal, unconditional love of Christ. Trusting in Christ. And we experience the word, the eternal, the ground of all being. God who created all there is and love as its foundation. And that's peaceful and warm. But so what? I always ask that question, so what? It means that God is bigger than our bumper sticker theology. Christ is more expansive than American Christianity. It changes our politics. It changes our view of the world. Because the more exclusive we make Christianity, the more pain it creates the more dangerous it becomes and the farther away we go from Christ's message. Jesus is not just for a few. Jesus is not just for American Christian nationalists. Jesus is not just for liberal Christians or progressive Christians, American Christians, one of the things, there's a house close to where we live that, that shows a flag, and on that flag is a Jesus with a crown of thorns, and Jesus is hugging an American flag. I'm not sure how to take that. In one way, I can see, okay, a desire for, for, for love in America. But in another way that I take it is meaning that somehow we are more special than any other country or place in the past 2,000 years or more. So do you see how when we think of only a few are, are Christians, only a few are accepted, you have to do this, this, and this. Or in the, even in the old Calvinist thinking of only the elect are going to heaven and then there are those who are destined to hell no matter what they can do because it is God's choice. Or having prayed a prayer at a specific time or specific place, we can see how we can start walling off God's love and the love of Christ. And when we start putting those walls up, and when we, especially when we do those walls in the name of God, what damage do we do? Christ 
Christ's love is from the beginning and for all. It's not exclusive to our politics or a sense of who is in and who is out. God's love extends to that person. I don't know who your that person is, but we all have that person, right? You know, <laughs> not that person. <laughs> God's love extends to that person. God's universal love in Christ from the beginning, before everything was created, breaks us out of our dualistic thinking, our tribal thinking, our scarcity thinking, into the universality, the unity and abundance of God and all that God created. This is how much God loved the world. God gave the Son, the one and only Son, and this is why, so that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in Christ, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending the Son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. That Christ came to help to put the world right again. Amen. that created all. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.